up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. I'm going to start with some recent history behind some current events. That's an image from the article, Hashtag Ferguson, Digital Protest, Hashtag Ethnography, and the Racial Politics of Social Media in the United States. It's an article about the protests that occurred in the summer of 2014 after Michael Brown, an unarmed black teenager, was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, more specifically, it's about the online components of those protests, what some people call hashtag activism, and the pros and the cons of dealing with political issues in that way through social media. Uh, the article also looks at what it looks like when anthropologists do their field work online through what they call hashtag ethnography. So the image on the screen, that's from a tweet by a young activist who was involved in this movement and the caption is if they gunned me down what picture would they use uh, would it be the picture of him in a t-shirt and a ball cap uh, pointing at the camera or would it be the picture of him in a bow tie with a saxophone so you can probably guess what his point is and who he means by they in, in both instances of saying they but I'll come back to that a bit later in the meantime here's a preview of the main themes of this episode I'm gonna start by introducing the anthropology of the media just what it is and what it studies I'll spend some time on the propaganda model, which is a way of addressing bias in, in the media. I'll talk a bit about fake news and the so-called post-truth era. I'll talk about accountability in the media, the, the Canadian media in particular. A little bit on semiotics and social media and activism. <music> I'll take a few minutes to introduce the anthropology of the media, what it is, and some of the more influential ethnographies from this field. Here are a couple of them pictured. Uh, we have Hollywood, The Dream Factory by Horton's Powdermaker, first published in 1950. This is an early example both of Western anthropologists studying their own cultures and also an example of the anthropology of the media. So Powdermaker did this by looking at the American film industry. And her main interest when she was doing this research way back in 1950 was how the social relations of the filmmaking process shaped what movies were about and what people made of them. So in other words, the role of the profit motive in the industry in shaping what the public saw and how they received it. So there's one example, another much more recent example, the cover of an ethnography from 2005, Dramas of Nationhood, The Politics of Television in Egypt by Laila Abu Lugod. Uh, this anthropologist looked at what Egyptian soap operas meant to the people who watched them. And the short version is, those soap operas were, they weren't just interesting stories, they were also a powerful source of national identity, as, as the ethnographer put it. Um, in episodes 9 and 10, I talked about Eva Mackey's study of what the Canadian media and the Canadian state tell us about what it means to be Canadian, to be a member of that imagined community we call Canada. Well, Lala Abu Lugod's research used a similar framework to study what Egyptian soap operas say about Egyptian national identity, about being Egyptian. Here are a few more points on what the anthropology of the media is and what it does based largely on this book, The Anthropology of Media, A Reader. So just as a sidebar for students, if you ever need a quick snapshot of a topic you're not too familiar with, these readers are usually a good place to start. They're published by textbook companies. They usually collect the most important parts of the most influential sources on a given topic, and they often have a nice, quick introduction that tells you the kind of general shape of that field. So this one does that for the anthropology of the media, and I'll share some thoughts and ideas from it. Uh, it was published in 2002, which is ancient history in terms of media studies. Uh, most people in 2002 still consider the internet uh, a luxury or, you know, uh, just for entertainment mainly. Uh, cell phones were mostly just for making phone calls. And there were some very early types of social media, but not many people knew about them or cared. But still, many of these insights from this reader from 2002 are still relevant, so I'll share some and then try to update them as I go. So I'll start by quoting the authors in the introduction. They write, The strength of anthropology lies in its concern with people and lived practices. So in other words, we're usually most interested in, in what people do with the media. The same way, for example, 
medical anthropologists are interested in what people do with their healthcare systems and the anthropology of nationalism focuses on uh, how the idea of the nation shows up in everyday life and the things that people do to express a sense of nationhood. Similarly, anthropologists who study the media look at what people do with the media. So with that goal in mind, anthropologists have asked a few key questions in their studies of the media and how people use it. We ask what meanings do people make out of media images and sounds. We look look at how people negotiate embedded ideologies, politics, and economics. So think about that point in relation to the concept of bias, which I'll get to in a little bit. What new forms of social interaction has the media enabled? And this reader from 2002 was asking this question, you know, several years before social media was, uh, was popular or, you know, at, at all normal or common. Um, how does the media alter our understandings of space and time? Which might sound familiar from some things I said in the episode on, on globalization. Um, can people previously excluded from media production use it to their advantage once they have access? So think about that in relation to the article that I mentioned at the start about hashtag activism. I should probably define what the media actually is before I get deeper into how people use it. Uh, the terms media and mediation both come from the Latin word medius, which means middle, so that would mean media technologies exist in the middle of something, kind of between two poles. And traditionally those were producers on one side and consumers on the other side. Usually that means very wealthy and powerful producers, like huge media corporations and on the other side, the ordinary people who consume their products. But there are many exceptions to that, of course. Uh, the ones noted in that reader from way back in 2002 were the internet, pirate radio, and local community TV stations. Um, there was a lot of excitement about the media in the 90s, and looking back, it was kind of a, a naive time in, in almost a quaint way, and looking back from 2020. Uh, the internet, like I said before, was brand new and not very useful yet, but it seemed to have limitless potential. Um, you don't hear much about pirate radio stations anymore, but way before podcasting and YouTube, people would sometimes get on the radio airwaves illegally without a license and broadcast from there. Uh, this was closely tied to the rave subculture, for example. Um, and now we can add to this social media. But again, the, this, this reader was written about four or five years before Twitter was launched and about six years before anybody knew what it was. So kind of naive, quaint times, but a lot of excitement about new media forms that were kind of dissolving that traditional split between the producers and the consumers of, of media. The reader then provides three categories for what anthropologists look at when they study the media. We look at texts, technologies, and contexts. So in this case, texts, of course, doesn't just mean text messages. It's, it's a general term for media products in any format. So any communication between two people or two bodies is a text. Uh, newspaper articles, books, YouTube videos, actual text messages. Many more examples, those are all texts. So when we study them, sometimes we focus on the content of those texts, but never in isolation because texts don't usually have one true meaning that's separate from context or interpretation. So for example, the same text can have two different meanings in two different places, or audiences can draw conclusions from texts that are very different from, from what was intended. With regards to technologies, anthropologists also look at the role that new developments in media technology play in cultural change. Uh, one example I looked at earlier in the series was Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities. When I talked about that idea in episode 9, I focused mainly on what it said about national identity, the idea that nations are imagined communities. So that research is a study in the anthropology of nationalism, but it's also an important example of the anthropology of the media. So uh, just to review a little bit, like I said in episodes 9 and 10, there's not really a such thing as Canadian, for example, that you can take for granted. It's a concept that comes out of a specific history, and it's something that we ourselves keep alive and keep in currency and, and kind of modify as time goes on by using the term and identifying with it in our daily lives. But back to the anthropology of the media, one of Anderson's other main points when looking at national identities was that the invention of the printing press was a major factor in what made national identities matter to people in the way they do now. Uh, the short version of the story to, to recap is that the invention of the printing press made it possible to mass produce books in the languages that most people actually spoke. 
which made them feel more connected to each other because they're reading things in the common language of their particular nation. And meanwhile, that language that they use gets more respect because now it's written down and seen as official. So the printing press um, kind of unintentional uh, you know, result of that invention is that, the, is that the idea of the nation starts to make more sense to more people. It's an example of studying the impact of media technology on culture. And finally, media context, which refers to the way we study the relationship between media texts and technologies and with broader trends in culture, in politics, in economics. And the current thinking is that all of these things are in this long-term, complicated, symbiotic relationship with each other, which means that one shapes the other and vice versa. Um, what people say in the media is shaped by their culture, and in turn, what they say, what they say um, either reshapes their culture or kind of keeps things going the way they, they, they were. Usually it's a bit of both, somewhere in the middle. So on that note, I want to come back to the concept of bias that I talked about in my instructional video on writing essays from a couple days ago. Um, whenever I'm marking essays and someone critiques an article by saying it's biased, I always underline that word biased and add a question mark because it's not enough to just say something is biased. The issue of bias is certainly important to consider when you're making an argument, but for an accusation of bias to mean something, you need to explain how something is biased and why that's a problem. Because bias in and of itself is not necessarily a problem because every media text is biased to at least some extent. So I found that calling something biased without explaining how and why it's biased, at worst, that can be kind of a lazy way to dismiss or criticize something. Um, it might sound like a bit of a bold statement, but I think most other anthropologists would also agree Everything is biased to at least some extent and really nothing is purely objective. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are true facts and there's a crucial difference between facts and fabrications or you know fantasies, but the way that those facts are packaged and shared, that's always shaped to at least some extent by the interests of the person or the organization who is sharing those facts. Sometimes that influence is barely detectable. So sometimes there is so little bias, it's almost as if there's none. Sometimes the bias, on the other hand, can be overwhelming, and that's because every media text, every news broadcast, every textbook, journal article, song, university lecture, YouTube video, bio lecture, or whatever, all those things are made by human beings with histories, with interests, with political, maybe some religious views, and everything is biased based on you know those, those allegiances of, of the person sending out the message. Um, and that includes this video series, it includes my own teaching. So this series is called Making Sense of a Changing World. And what a large part of this series kind of constitutes the lecture portion of a course that is an introduction to anthropology. But it's really Ryan James's introduction to anthropology. There are certain things that I have to cover when I teach, but I have a lot of academic freedom um, in terms of you know how I decide to meet those, those common goals. So students in my courses get a lot of urban anthropology they get a lot of Toronto and Chicago and the Dominican Republic and Brazil because those are topics that I know something about and that I choose to teach on. Um, if you took the same course, the same Intro to Anthro course with another instructor, you might get, for example, more medical anthropology. You might get a lot of ethnography on India or Madagascar or French postmodernist literary theory. In any case, these are all partial views of the world from the perspectives of the individuals who teach those courses and that's okay. It would be a problem if you took every course in your degree from the same instructor. That would be a case where the bias involved would probably be too much and you'd, you'd end up with a very limited perspective on, on what you've chosen to major in. But the concept is you take 20 or 30 different courses to get a degree. For the most part, those courses are taught by different people. You might have a couple of courses with the same instructor, but you're usually getting 20 to 30 kind of partial views of the world by taking different courses offered by different specialists. And then all of that adds up to something you can use to challenge and expand your own worldview and then come out of the university with a useful foundation for critical thinking. That's, that's how it's supposed to work. And along the way, no one person is giving you an unbiased or complete view of the world. And if they claim to, as some do, they are either wrong or, or lying or arrogant or probably some combination of all three. But back to the media, of course bias is real and of course bias can be a problem, especially when you consider how it relates to power. So in the case of media outlets, that are owned by big business, what we, I think, used to call the corporate media or the mainstream media, 
An important part of that bias is the structure of the industry. It's obvious that there is a lot of money and resources tied into the messages you get from the mainstream media. And that fact definitely has an impact on what gets said. So I want to show you what's called the propaganda model, which is a method for understanding how bias in the corporate media works. But it's also a model that was created way back in 1988. So it's quite a bit dated. I'll just outline it and then do my best to bring things up a little more up to date. But today and 32 years ago alike, anthropologists say it's crucial to look at how power imbalances shape what the media says and how people access it and how it affects their thinking. And one way to look at those power imbalances is this propaganda model that I've been describing. It's one of the key ideas in this book called Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media, which was first written, as I said, in 1988 by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. Uh, Herman was a professor of finance. Noam Chomsky was first trained as a linguist, and now he's one of the best-known political theorists still working today. Um, he's one of the few academics that some people outside of academia have heard of, and he certainly needs no introduction from the likes of me. But anyway, it's, it's not quite a work of anthropology, this book, but one of the authors, Chomsky, is an expert in one of the four fields of anthropology, and it is a model for understanding how and why the corporate media works that some anthropologists, including myself, have found quite useful. So here is a quote from the first chapter of the, of the book that sums up what the model is all about. So way back in 1988, Herman and Chomsky introduced their book with, with this. They wrote, the mass media serve as a system for communicating messages and symbols to the general populace. It is their function, the function of the media, to amuse, entertain, and inform, and to inculcate individuals with the values, beliefs, and codes of behavior that will integrate them into the institutional structures of the larger society. In a world of concentrated wealth and major conflicts of class interest, to fulfill this role requires systematic propaganda. And then they talk about how there, there are and have been totalitarian states where the media really is under the direct control of an elite, and so the government uses the media to tell people what to think, However, it is much more difficult to see a propaganda system at work where the media are private and formal censorship is absent. This is especially true where the media actively compete, periodically attack and expose corporate and governmental malfeasance, and aggressively portray themselves as spokespersons for free speech and the general community interest. What is not evident and remains undiscussed in the media is the limited nature of such critiques, as well as the huge inequality in command of resources and its effect both on access to a private media system and on its behavior and performance. So there's a link in the description to a video I recommend of uh, one of the two co-authors, Noam Chomsky, explaining his view of how this works to a journalist in the mainstream media. Uh, that, that clip is from some point, I think in the early 90s, but a lot of it is still relevant. So I recommend pausing this video, watching that one, and then coming back. So here's the details of how propaganda in the media works. According to Herman and Chomsky, they came up with this five filters model. So at the top, ownership of the media, and then working down the funnel, advertising, sourcing, flack, and finally, anti-communism. I'll go through each of these in the next few slides. And the point is, these are the specific things that shape media content, usually towards the interests of the people who own most of our media outlets. The first one is ownership, and what I'm trying to show with this graphic is that as a result of decades of buyouts and mergers, four corporations now control about 90% of the media in Canada, and they are Bell, Quebecor, Rogers, and Shaw. Uh, we also have our own public broadcast of the CBC, but its funding has been cut heavily in recent years, and when compared to other public broadcasters internationally, it's not very well supported at all. So Herman and Chomsky, with the propaganda model, they, they were writing about the United States in the 80s, of course, but I've subbed in some more recent Canadian data to make pretty much the same point, that these four companies are large, profit-seeking corporations owned and controlled by quite wealthy people and uh, added up, they control 90% of our media. The second filter is what Herman and Chomsky call the advertising license to do business. So when a TV station, for example, does business, the product they're selling is not the TV shows. The product is us, the audience. Uh, the business model is to create programming that attracts an audience who has disposable income and then sell that audience to advertisers. So even with newspapers, which you had to pay for in the old days, traditionally, even then, 
newspapers got most of their revenue from ads and classifieds, not from people buying the papers. That's changing because less and less people are buying you know, newspapers or placing ads in them anymore for obvious reasons. But even before the internet and all this free content, um, the main way media companies made their money was by selling ads and classifieds, not by selling actual products to consumers. Here's a quote from the book that explains that in a bit more detail. As the authors put it, the power of advertisers over TV programming stems from the simple fact that they buy and pay for the programs. They are the patrons who provide the media subsidy. As such, the media compete for their patronage, developing specialized staff to solicit advertisers and necessarily having to explain how their programs serve advertisers' needs. Filter number three is sourcing, which refers to the tendency for news corporations to get their information from other corporations. There are many examples of this. Uh, one seemingly harmless one is newswire services. So media companies pay huge sums of money for licenses to the newswires uh, like Canadian Press or Associated Press in the U.S. So that if something newsworthy happens very far away, they can get ready-made content about that event that requires little, if any, effort or resources. So it makes sense in a way. So this way, you know, hundreds of local papers don't need to all send a reporter um, to someplace far away where something newsworthy happens. They can all rely on this newswire service that they all pay for. But potentially more problematically is this is where the field of public relations or PR comes into play. Uh, very large organizations often have their own in-house PR departments. Uh, politicians have their own staff to handle PR. And there are specialized PR firms, many of them also very large, who provide these services to other organizations on contract. Um, there's a lot of back and forth in the personnel of corporate PR departments and at news outlets. Uh, many PR reps are ex-journalists and vice versa, and that's especially the case now that it's getting harder and harder to make a steady living as a journalist. Basically, it's a small circle of people who know each other and speak the same language and may have been colleagues at one point or another or may still be friends. So Chomsky and Herman cite another theorist, Mark Fishman, who calls this the principle of bureaucratic affinity, which is the idea that only other bureaucracies can satisfy the input needs of a news bureaucracy. So bureaucracies kind of tend to speak each other's language and they can give each other ready-made content that can kind of be plugged in to fill holes in newspapers or in TV broadcasts. Um, out of the same kind of practice, you get things like so-called advertorials, which are ad content that is made to look like news coverage. So in that case, there always has to be fine print somewhere that says paid content or somewhere along those lines. And if you look at the headline closely, it might be in a slightly different font or something. But if you're not really paying close attention, it looks like real news. And that's the point. Moving down the list, uh, fourth filter is flack. And uh, it's a good point to emphasize that this is not a conspiracy theory. There's, there's, there's not an idea that there is one evil puppeteer or like shadow organization controlling the media and controlling what we think. But the reality is individuals and groups of people can indeed interfere in what's being said. And the more power and wealth they have, the more likely they are able, they, they'll be able to do that. But it's not as simple as, as I said, some kind of conspiracy where some evil organization controls the media. Um, no one is saying that. In fact, this model is an opportunity or a way to think about the media that can help move past those kind of pop culture conspiracy theories, ideally anyway. Anyway, um, what they mean by flack is negative responses to a media statement or a program. So that could look like complaints or threats against journalists or, or outlets from, from powerful people. It could look like workplace discipline against journalists for kind of stepping out of line. Uh, flack could be a well-organized campaign or it could be the independent actions of individuals. And here's one example of someone who got caught basically dishing out flack in a way that was way over the line and highly inappropriate by any standard. Uh, this is the former CEO of Bell Media, and uh, it's an article in the Globe and Mail, which ironically is owned by Bell Media now. But anyway, the CEO, the ex-CEO was fired after admitting to trying to influence national news coverage on a CRTC decision on unbundling cable packages. So just to break things down a bit, the CRTC is the, the government body that, that regulates the airwaves, ideally. Um, and they were about to make a decision on making it harder for companies to force you to you know, pay for a bunch of channels you don't want in, in, in order to get the one channel that you do want. So unbundling. Um, the, C, the former CEO of Bell was very angry 
that the CRTC was attempting to crack down on bundling. So he tried to bully his own staff at one of his TV outlets into refusing to give any airtime to the head of the CRTC, and he was fired for this. So examples of flack happen all the time that aren't, you know, punished or called out. But this was an example of one that went too far, and so the former CEO was fired for this. Now, if you're worried about this former CEO, you don't have to worry because he's okay in the end. A month after he was let go by Bell, he then got a job as the chief marketing officer at Sprint, the American internet and cell phone company. So might have looked rough for a second, but Mr. Kroll is okay. No need to worry about Mr. Kroll. Um, another example of flack, arguably, would be the backlash against the CBC that you see from time to time, usually from conservative politicians, every time there's an election. Uh, conservatives tend to dislike the CBC's takes on current events, and the very idea of having a national publicly funded broadcaster kind of runs counter to the kind of neoliberal ideology that a lot of conservative politicians embrace. So for decades, various politicians have been threatening to cut the CBC's budget or scrap it altogether, and some have made the argument that this is an example of, of flack, of this fourth of, of the five filters of, uh, of propaganda and media ownership. And the final filter was anti-communism. And again, they were writing this about the American media in the 1980s. And the American media in the 1980s was full of fiercely patriotic and anti-communist imagery. Because in the 80s, um, communism was a real thing, and the United States was still in a so-called Cold War with the USSR. But the local American understanding of what communism was in the United States was this kind of fuzzy concept that could be used against anybody with critical views. So if a politician or a journalist was talking about social inequality a lot or you know, pointing out how unfair capitalism can be, for example, um, it was pretty easy to sort of shut them down by painting them as a communist and encouraging people to fear and loathe, loathe them and stay away from them. So again, like I said, it's a dated model. It's from the late 1980s. At that point, the fifth filter was anti-communism. More recently, uh, one of these authors, Chomsky, has said that anti-terrorism kind of took the place of anti-communism after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And then after 9-11, the war on terror became the new, you know, kind of fifth filter, anti-communism, replacing anti-communism. <laughs> So that was a snapshot of what academics were saying about the corporate media in the late 1980s. Uh, back then, the corporate media was seen as almost all-powerful. It was this huge, very profitable monolith that had a lot of sway over what people consumed and what they thought. So now let's fast forward three decades later and switch to Canada. And what we tend to call the corporate media doesn't seem quite as powerful as it once did. And here are some stats to illustrate that. Over the past roughly 10 years, about 16,000 Canadian journalists have lost their jobs and dozens of local newspapers have been merged or folded. And now the industry is getting a government bailout. So in late 2018, the federal liberals announced they would provide $595 million in funding to the Canadian media over a five-year period that would come in the form of tax credits and incentives, and the point was to help the media adapt to the current reality, or more specifically, the new ways in which people consume media, and also to help them adapt to the huge losses that many outlets have suffered, uh, largely due to revenue decline, largely due to advertising moving almost entirely online. Um, so the majority of that money, that $595 million in help, most of that will come through a tax credit to news organizations that they can use to help cover labor costs, up to 25% of a particular uh, employee's salary, for example. Um, they're also offering a tax, a tax credit to individuals. So now you can get back up to $75 a year on your taxes for a digital news subscription to a Canadian outlet. Um, to qualify for these, uh, the, these tax breaks, a news organization needs to have a board of directors with 75% Canadian citizens and the chair must be Canadian. So in this age of global media, that's how the Canadianness of a news outlet is decided. 75% uh, Canadian board of directors and the chair must be a Canadian. Um, since the plan was announced in late 2018, there's been a lot of critique and a lot of accusations, of course. The Conservatives said that the Liberals had done this basically to try to buy off the media when an election was approaching. 
And meanwhile, many in the independent and left-wing media are saying that this is basically rewarding huge corporations for doing a bad job of adapting to new technology and that none of this will really result in a better informed public, which is the purported purpose of this. Anyway, with that propaganda model, obviously Herman and Chomsky had a fav fairly unfavorable view of the mainstream media and uh, things have gotten a lot more complicated since then. So I want to show you this model that I found online that illustrates the current media landscape. Um, it's not really academic, and I want to note that I don't really agree with all of it, but I think it's interesting. It was made by a lawyer in uh, Denver, USA, who's frustrated with the state of the American media. And uh, she made this in hopes that it would help people think uh, more critically about where they get their information from. This is an earlier version of this chart. This one is from 2016, I think. Um, in this version, running along the x-axis, uh, the, the one across the bottom, you have political bias ranging from liberal to conservative. And uh, the extreme end of, of both sides is what she calls, quote, utter garbage and conspiracy theories. And there are liberal and conservative varieties of, of that, of utter garbage and conspiracy theories. Uh, along the y-axis, from bottom to top, she ranks these sources in terms of journalistic quality. Uh, the lowest quality sources are what she calls sensational or clickbait. Uh, the second lowest are what she calls basic AF. Uh, in the middle are sources that, quote, meet high standards. And uh, at the higher end, she has analytical and complex sources, in, in her view. The scary thing, or maybe the, the strange thing is, the sources that Herman and Chomsky talked about 32 years ago in the propaganda model, most of those sources would be right in the middle of this chart, with minimal political bias and medium journalistic quality. Examples include uh, the New York Times, NBC, ABC, most local city newspapers. So that's the mainstream American media, and this chart calls those great sources of news. Uh, somewhere below that, you have CNN and most local TV news uh, and some other sources which the author says are, quote, better than not reading at all. And in the high range are sources like The Guardian and The Atlantic, which she calls great sources of in-depth news. There's also this gray zone of more biased sources on both the liberal and the conservative sides, which she says are good for confirming your existing opinions, but bad for convincing others. Be careful of how much time you hang out here. Uh, the bottom left corner is liberal clickbait, and the bottom right corner is conservative clickbait, which is often what we think of as fake news. And since then, the chart has gone through six versions. It's gotten a lot more comprehensive and complex through each iteration. And uh, like I said, I don't agree with uh, a fair number of things on, on the chart, but I think it's worthwhile, and I think it's an interesting kind of sign of the times. So if you do have time, I recommend checking it out. There's not much anthropology on this, but there is other social scientific literature on it. This question of fake news, which uh, really came to the forefront, I think, with the 2016 American presidential election. Of course, it was a problem long before that, but that's when I remember, you know, really hearing the, the phrase fake news uh, often. Um, this study is from shortly after that election, released by economists from Stanford and New York universities, and they wanted to look at the impact of fake news on that election. They didn't come to a firm conclusion. But they said that fake news probably had less of an impact than many people think. Uh, they found, for example, that 14% of Americans relied on social media for their main source of political news. Uh, most of them, meanwhile, still rely on TV news. Fake news in support of Trump was shared four times more than fake news in support of Clinton was. But only half of those who saw fake news believed it. Um, even though it may not have had a huge impact directly on who people voted for, the authors of the study do say that social media has a huge impact on the political culture in general. Um, you hear this a lot, that things are becoming more polarized as people tend to read more and more of the things that confirm what they already think. And it's potentially dangerous, these authors note, that, quote, anyone can now dream up and disseminate a story, real or not, with nothing more than an imagination and internet access. Some say things have deteriorated to the point that we, we're in something called a post-truth era. Uh, the term post-truth itself goes back to the 90s, but the way that it's usually used now dates back to a 2010 blog post by David Roberts who applied uh, that idea of the post-truth era to this, the very poisonous and misinformed debates around Obama's efforts to, to fight climate change uh, through the, the late part of the 2000s decade. Um, 
in a nutshell, what David Roberts means by post-truth is that people are now reasoning in reverse, he says. So the way reasoning is supposed to work is you start with facts and then draw conclusions from facts and then use those conclusions to take positions on issues and then vote for the party who shares the most of your positions on the greatest number of issues. Uh, David Roberts says that many people are now doing this in reverse. So they start with a party that they choose based on values or emotion. Um, they adopt all of that party's positions and then come up with arguments to support those positions and then cherry pick or dig for or just make up facts to support those arguments. Um, as for what anthropologists have said, uh, we, we often start from this idea of situated knowledge, which has become pretty influential since about the 1980s. It comes from Donna Haraway, uh, a theorist who is much too complicated to accurately you know, summarize in a short video segment like this. But the idea of situated knowledge is quite similar to what I said earlier about how nothing is truly objective because every idea comes from a person who comes from a particular time and place, etc. So what does all this mean in these troubled times that we now find ourselves in? Um, one example, towards the end of 2017, American anthropologist Naomi Schiller discussed the idea of approximate truth at, at a conference appearance. Um, the idea is we can't go back to trusting in an idea of pure objectivity. Instead, kind of the best we can shoot for, you know, somewhere between that and just kind of accepting whatever message comes our way is what she calls approximate truth. So obviously there are empirical facts and that's important. But there's also what she calls a messy process of deliberation in which we all put together our situated knowledge and come to the best kind of closest truth that we can, that we can establish at that time and place in which we find ourselves. That's approximate truth, kind of similar to the idea of situated knowledge. Now to complicate things even further, there's this recent report that found that fears over fake news and so-called echo chambers are overblown, at least in a Canadian context. This report was put out by a think tank called the Public Policy Forum. It's based on a survey they did of over a thousand Canadians. And from that, they found that most people are still getting their political news from traditional media outlets. Um, the top three outlets that people get their news from, their political news from, were the CBC, the CTV, and the Huffington Post. I guess the Huffington Post isn't really traditional in this sense, but the authors of this report, I think, put it in that category because they felt it wasn't especially ideological or sensational. Um, they also found that people tend to get their news from the same sources, regardless of who they vote for. Um, so whether someone supported the Conservatives, the Liberals, or the NDP, most of them are still getting most of their political news from sources like the CBC, the CTV, and the Huffington Post. Uh, meanwhile, so-called ideological sources, those that take a, a far left or a far right approach, none of those even cracked the top 20 as far as the most popular news sources. So according to this one report, the problem isn't really fake news or echo chambers, uh, which might sound you know, like it's some kind of relief, but there still is a bigger problem and maybe a more troubling problem. The most troubling point of the report, according to its authors, is that the more mainstream media people consumed, the more misinformed they were. So people were asked simple, factual questions about current events, and uh, basically those who consumed more news got more questions wrong, which led some commentators to make the point that the problem isn't so much fake news as it is badly written, badly produced news, and that's the real issue facing our current media landscape. But what can you do if you see something in the mainstream media that is so far outside of any kind of approximate truth or situated knowledge or anything, you know, acceptable? If you see something that is obviously fake news or propaganda or racist or somehow in some other way problematic, what recourse do you have? Um, on that note, I, I want you to listen to the first couple of minutes of a podcast from, from 2019 about the National News Media Council, which is basically an industry association for the media. Um, it's voluntary, it's self-regulating, and uh, as an ordinary citizen, this is who you can complain to uh, about fake news or like really egregious bias in a news story, for example. So there's a link in the description to an episode of the Canada Land podcast about the, the kinds of coverage that the council looks into, and I recommend listening from 38 seconds in until about 525. That portion is journalist Jesse Brown introducing his interview with two members of the National News Media Council.
But before you do that, just the content warning, that clip involves discussions of hate crimes and racist extremism. But if you feel like you're okay to listen to that content at the moment, I recommend pausing this video, listening to that, and then, and then coming back to this one. If you're interested and you have the time, I recommend checking out the whole episode. But what it basically boils down to is that council only has teeth if the media outlet that has been complained about chooses to care. Uh, the journalist in question in that clip and the organization she worked for seem to have pretty much laughed off the report. Uh, they said it was liberal bias and they continued doing what they do. So it's 2020, and of course I need to bring everything into the present by talking about COVID. Here is an article that came out um, about a week before I recorded this in an academic journal called Misinformation Review. It says, those who get their news from social media are more likely to believe fake news about COVID. Well, there's this piece back in April from UNESCO. Uh, unreliable and false information is spreading around the world to such an extent that some commentators are now referring to this new avalanche of misinformation that's, that's come along with COVID-19 as a so-called disinfodemic. So there you go. UNESCO is making up words to describe the sheer volume of misinformation about COVID. About a year ago in the, the pre-COVID era, which now feels like a lifetime ago, I came across some research on social media that I find kind of interesting and also terrifying and also a bit hopeful, all at the same time uh, by a, a scholar slash author named Cal Newport. Newport is a professor of computer science who's also written a few mass market books on social media and how best to use it or not. Um, and this is what he says has happened to us over the past decade or so as a result of social media and uh, the way smartphones now are. Uh, Cal Newport writes, the urge to check Twitter or refresh Reddit becomes a nervous twitch that shatters uninterrupted time into shards too small to support the presence necessary for an intentional life. So that's a quote from his book, Digital Minimalism. And he says this is a completely new thing. It's a new state of being for humans, and it's something that none of us signed up for. It's also apparently not even what smartphones were originally supposed to be for. So Newport goes back to... Uh, Steve Jobs' speech from January 2007, for example, when Jobs first unveiled uh, the first iPhone to the public. And back then from that speech, it's the, the main selling point of the first iPhone was that it was like an MP3 player that could also make phone calls. And that's it. It was not supposed to be this device that keeps you constantly connected to everything all the time. It was not supposed to be what it became. It was just supposed to make life easier um, because you would no longer have to carry your iPod in one pocket and your cell phone in, in another. It was one machine for two purposes. It wasn't really until the beginning of the 2010s decade that the social media platforms started designing their apps to make them deliberately addictive. And now apparently the, the likes and the other affirmations you get from using social media have a similar effect as the high that people experience from, from gambling. So pulling the screen down on Twitter so that it bounces back up refreshed is like using a slot machine. Same mechanics, same brain chemistry, and also addictive. So this it means that the past decade or so has brought humans to this never-seen-before state where it's possible to never do nothing and never be bored. And many researchers are worried about this. They say that we need downtime. We need that time to process our lives. And without it, we're about to see a mental illness epidemic. So what's the solution? Cal Newport's answer is what he calls digital minimalism, which does not mean giving up on all technology or being a Luddite. It means, in his words, being deliberate and mindful and intentional about how we use social media and smartphones. And uh, perhaps most importantly, making time for boredom and for solitude, real solitude, not being alone and looking at your phone. Which sounds easier said than done, especially with the way things are now, but here's that same author in a blog post just last month saying that it's even more important now to push back against that pressure to work all the time and to be connected all the time. As Newport puts it, we need to, quote, structure our obligations, build our time blocks, and prioritize our deep work to the, to the fullest extent possible. And, and deep work is what he means by being completely focused on one task and not distracted by notifications, etc. Um, anyway, all of this is, like I said, easier said than done. And my problem with this kind of self-help and personal development advice, even though it is helpful to some extent, 
is that it always operates at the individual level, as if it's just about all of us individually making the right choice to, you know, cut down on screen usage, etc. When, in my view, especially with the way things are with, with COVID and working from home, etc., it's kind of a privilege to be able to pick and choose when you use screens at, at, at the moment, to at least some extent. But it's still good advice for those who do have enough control over their work obligations to, to make it happen, um, prioritizing deep work and focus and, and minimizing the screens. So now on to social media and activism and this article, hashtag Ferguson, digital protest, hashtag ethnography, and the racial politics of social media in the United States. Um, before we get into the content, I'll fill you in a bit on the situation in Ferguson, Missouri in the summer of 2014. And this is some important background to the uprisings that followed the killing of George Floyd by police in May 2020. So back to 2014, Michael Brown was 19 years old. He was shot at least six times by the same officer. It was ruled that the police officer acted in self-defense and so the, the officer was not indicted. And so this article, Hashtag Ferguson, is about the uprisings that followed the killing of Michael Brown, in particular, the online response. So here's their argument in a nutshell they wrote in 2014. Social media platforms have become powerful sites for documenting and challenging episodes of police brutality and the misrepresentation of racialized bodies in, in mainstream media. And they also write that hashtag activism can forge a shared political temporality and that social media provides strategic outlets for challenging systemic racism, or as they put it in the conclusion, social media casts a spotlight on this small Missouri township, that's Ferguson, but more importantly, more importantly, by propelling Ferguson into a broader, mediatized, virtual space, social media users were able to show that Ferguson is everywhere, not only in the sense of a broad political sphere, but also in the sense of the underlying social and political relationships that haunt the nation as a whole. And they arrived at that conclusion through an approach called semiotics, uh, which is something that came out of linguistics about a century ago. In short, it's a way of studying how people make meaning from things. And you can take a whole course in this, so I'm simplifying it very heavily. It's just a start. Um, but one of the core ideas that I'll introduce you to is this idea of the signifier, the signified, and the sign. So the signifier is anything that tells you about something. It could be a word, it could be a picture, a facial expression, um, or another example, the word pen written on a page is a signifier. So if I write the word pen on a sheet of paper, that's a signifier. It signifies this object, the, the, the pen. The pen that I'm holding in my hand is the signified, and these two things add up to the sign, what we understand a pen is and what a pen is used for. In the case of the Hashtag Ferguson article, these authors are looking at the effects that hashtagging has on this process that I just outlined. So in this case, this signified is the town of Ferguson, Missouri. It's a real place. People live and work there. Uh, the name Ferguson, Missouri, written on a page or displayed on a screen, that's the signifier. So it's something that we can read and we know what it refers to. If you add up the actual place, and the name, you get Ferguson the sign, the, the town, its name, and also whatever else it means to you, depending on where you're from and how much you were following current events in 2014, probably. So the next level of complication is you put a hashtag in front of this, and now hashtag Ferguson is the signifier. So in this case, what's the signified? Traditionally, it would be the town of Ferguson, Missouri, the actual place. This reading that I'm mentioning, hashtag Ferguson, those authors say that that link is changing. They say hashtagging is a way of infusing a signifier with all sorts of new meanings. But I don't want to get too caught up in the size signifier, signified distinction. I just wanted to explain what semiotics is. And the takeaway is words mean different things to different people. And maybe Twitter has given us a new way of, of making meaning by hashtagging. <laughs> wrap up this has been an introduction to the anthropology of the media which is a kind of narrow specialization within anthropology but it covers a lot of ground anyway um i've talked a bit about what anthropologists look at when they study the media and a lot of that has been about balancing a concern for individuals and communities agency with also remembering that the mass media is an incredibly powerful and influential force in our lives. Uh, like Herman and Chomsky tried to illustrate back in 1988, 
powerful interests do indeed have you know a, a large effect on the messages that we get and what we tend to believe but it's not as simple by any means as some kind of evil network of puppeteers that are you know behind this whole thing and controlling it um and a lot of today's conspiracy theories and fake news are based on the fantasy that that is the case um it's a very dangerous idea i've uh I talked about some emerging research on how how bad all of this media saturation apparently is for us, but also how people who often seem quite powerless have managed to affect some massive structural changes by embracing some aspects of that technology strategically. Um, a lot of the infrastructure and the momentum for the uprisings or be behind the uprisings against systemic racism in 2020 came out of those uprisings in 2014, um, long before that as well, of course, but that history of Ferguson in 2014 really looms large in, in the current climate. Um, and the strategic use of social media, as damaging as social media can also be, was an important part of that movement. So I'm going to stop there. Next episode continues on some of these themes with visual anthropology, and then the series concludes with the anthropocene.